you, Stuart, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, there's time for questions and uh, discussion. Thomas. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Um, I have relation to, I have to say, uh, I have a question related to my own interests. I've been, in my recent work, I've been thinking about the conception of the digital. And um, I've, I was reminded uh, by the title of uh, a Wired article which has been um, published, I forgot now the author, but it was titled um, Mother Falls and Mother Earth, where they talked about the different, yeah, we were talking about different digital capabilities in relation to uh, the materiality of um, fiber optic cables and also in relation to uh, data flows and thinking about uh, <coughs> speed, slowness and connectivity. And I'm thinking um, in the information age where we are now, whether we can think a geopolitics w without uh, a conception of the digital. Okay. Do you want me to answer the yeah. future as I go? Okay. I'm not a good person to talk about the digital. It's not something I work on particularly. And I think what, what you've suggested there is interesting in that even if you think about the digital, you're still thinking of the motherboard, the connectivity, the fiber, cable, fiber optic cables, the even something as nebulous, it seems, as the cloud, cloud storage is something that is rooted in all of the, the data storage facilities that exist in particular places and the network between them. And so I would want to stress, and I think many people that have written on these questions do talk about this, of the physical infrastructure that makes possible the digital infrastructure and vice versa. Where I'm interested in this is in relation to cities and a research center at New York University that I've been working with where they're thinking about what big data can do in terms of how a city understands itself and governs itself. And there, it's clear that a lot of government decisions, government in a broad sense of how you govern and rule and regulate a city, are being made on the basis now of a vastly expanded data set of, of questions. The, the data that they have is so vast, the question now becomes, how do you analyze it? How do you cut through it? How do you, how do you get to something that, that's worth answering? So I'd see the, the digital is, is very important in thinking about a whole range of these questions in terms of the metric. How do you measure things? That, that is being transformed with the techniques available now. But at the same time, I'd want to stress the kind of material, physical infrastructure that makes those questions possible. And it, the, the question of infrastructure, many more capable people than me have written about politics of infrastructure. But um, somebody like Stephen Graham's work, for example, or Andrew Barry's work, thinking about what Andrew Barry calls political machines, um, or the, the politics of infrastructure projects, and the way that this can become both something that makes cities possible, but also sometimes becomes a target in war. One of the first things that gets taken out when a state is attacked is the infrastructure. The water treatment plants, the electricity, the, the grid system, this is often one of the first things targeted. So it both makes cities possible and, and allows a city or a, a society, sometimes even more generally a state, to be switched off by the targeting of the infrastructure that makes those things possible. So it's the interrelation that I'd be interested in on that. Yep. Uh, yeah, Tim was a graduate student at the Faculty of Spatial Sciences. Um, and uh, let me, uh, actually I was also going to ask a question uh, which was uh, directed uh, towards technology, the role of technology, but like, uh, since you just said like, uh, this is not your expertise really. Um, uh, but let me uh, maybe briefly uh, comment on it. Like, uh, since I was uh, surprised by this uh, very fundamental uh, and essentialist uh, approach, how, how, you, how you frame it, uh, since uh, I know your work uh, on, on the Fever and, and, and my work also connects to the Fever very much, and um, like, yeah, and then like the philosophical debate about space, uh, like, um, does space matter? You said, like, uh, like uh, I mean, to me, or well, what I know, like, uh, when I talk to f uh, philosophers, like, uh, they would still say no, uh, like, uh, for, for the favorite does, uh, but like, uh, I mean, it's good that, that uh, the favorite made some, made some uh, approach uh, in this direction. 
and it is also maybe uh, convincing to some extent, uh, which I would certainly agree. But um, um, yeah, like uh, the, the the role of uh, technology, um, uh, like um, actually uh, supports this argument that, that space is not relevant for philosophy, since uh, technology uh, like uh, would uh, transcend space, like and in, in territory space, physical space. It becomes less and less important, like uh, like due to technology, and then we can almost uh, we almost reach a point like uh, where we not still, but again uh, like uh, could say like uh, space does not matter really, like uh, and uh, like uh, so it would be uh, and I would connect this uh, to territory then of course, but um, <coughs> yeah, so that would be my comment. Uh, it seems to me that you can accept the importance of the digital and other new technologies and think that questions of physical space and territory are still important. It doesn't seem to me to be a, an either or between those. Now, I wouldn't want to suggest that the changes in, in modern technology have not had any impact on those kinds of questions. Clearly, they have. But nor have they rendered those questions unimportant. Uh, even with modern transportation, it still takes time to come from my home in England to come and give a lecture here. Uh, even in places where social media is used um, around a, a popular unrest or popular uprising, social media is an organizing tool to tell people where they need to meet in physical space uh, within a city square or some uh, other location to, to mobilize. And the, the importance of the embodied nature of protest in particular sites and locations was important, even if technology was important in terms of the coalescing of forces and the, the development of those kinds of questions. So for me, it would be, of course, many things have transformed the way that we understand and experience physical space. And you don't have to just look at modern technologies about this. The invention of the wheel, for example, changes how people experience physical space and distance. If you look at the way that the Roman Empire was structured, uh, it was to do with technologies that partly helped to explain the geographical reach of the Roman Empire. It was much quicker to move by sea than it was by land. Therefore, the Roman Empire largely expanded to land around the Mediterranean and to greater or lesser extents of distance from there. The um, importance of the railroad, the locomotive and the telegraph pole in terms of the expansion of the American Empire westwards to become the whole of the contiguous 48 states. So technology from as far back as you want to go changes how people experience space, changes how people transform space, changes how people po um, govern and, and regulate space. The mapping technologies as they develop in the 16th and 17th century make possible the large scale surveying and cartographic practices of states towards it. So there's a transformation in technology that has an impact in terms of the, the physicality of space and how that's uh, understood. So it doesn't seem to me that it's an either or around those kind of questions. To say that territory is less important today, there's a number of things in terms of just the news. If we turn on the news at the moment, how important territorial questions remain in a whole range of registers. Just immediate Ukraine, Iraq, Syria, and the Islamic State, Scotland wanting to vote to become an independent country, and where the border would have been both on land and at sea if Scotland had chosen to become independent what's happening at the moment within northern Nigeria, what happened a couple of years ago in Mali. Uh, we could carry on with a whole range of these where territory, physical space in, in the most sort of obvious sense of it becomes a, and remains an important question around this. But following the Lefebvre line, that, that physical material space is only one way we understand space. It's also the space of abstract plans and surveys, be they of an entire territory of a state, or down to the city grid and the planner's understanding of how a city should be experienced. And then the way that people experience and use and live in cities, places, territories, other physical spaces, and transform them through everyday practices in a way. So all of those is different layers within those. And while technology is certainly transforming our relation to these questions, to suggest that these are no longer important, that, that seems to me to be a, a more problematic claim around that. Benjamin? Thanks, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, and, and I'm wondering, how material is the geo? 
in all of this? Because it seems to me that in many of the examples, uh, this, you are using formulation, formulations such as uh, a sense of earthy groundedness. And um, there seems to be a particular form of well, almost desire for groundedness at play, uh, which uh, even if we imagine uh, matter to be vibrant would be still an imagination of matter. And perhaps one example of that could be, could be Heidegger uh, and his relation to the themes of groundedness and maybe even Bruce uh, um, Ward, which uh, does not fully resonate politically precisely because for him they're just two Germans who count. Uh, essentially, and that's uh, that's only in Nietzsche, uh, which puts him at odds with politics uh, for reasons of being philosophically eccentric, which is a very, very interesting, uh, interesting consideration. But that is a particular imagination and idealization uh, of the geo, uh, which strikes me as not necessarily material, even in the sense. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why Heidegger is problematic. For, for these kinds of questions. Uh, and I think you're right, Heidegger is, even though he kind of makes all of those claims of the rootedness in the soil and the, that he lives in a peasant area and that the people he sees at the weekends are not philosophy professors, but they're farmers and, and other people from, from those areas, what is he trying to do with the reading of Herdel in um, the reading of that, that painting by Van Gogh is to come up with a new way of thinking about these on a kind of ontological, philosophical level. So sure, Heidegger, absolutely. But I don't think that critique works for a number of the other people that I'm talking about. And it certainly doesn't for the way that I want to think about that physical sense within these questions. The ICE project, for example, that, that I'm now getting involved in with um, International Boundaries Research Unit at Durham, or previous work on river boundaries, a very large percentage of the world's boundaries of land, of land either cross or run along rivers. And rivers is a dynamic feature of the landscape that challenges <coughs> straightforward ways. Of now, that's a very physical, pro physical process, the kind of thing that my old physical geography colleagues would have understood as through the geomorphologists. And I was saying to them, how does this work politically? How do we think about the relation between the geophysical and the geopolitical around these questions? I think if you think about the question of terrain, which some of my new work is, is turning towards, if you look at terrain analysis within the military, it's extremely important. Is the ground solid enough to move heavy armor, tanks, and other equipment across that land? If the ground is too soft, so through a desert, if you look at the uh, North African war in the Second World War, if the ground is too soft, then the tanks won't be supported on it, so that you have to use different type of equipment to, to move over that. Can you get this through um, a large forested area? Um, can you, how do you fight a war in the jungles of Southeast Asia? These kind of terrain analysis, the physicality of this, and you can go way back with this. You have elements of this, for example, in Julius Caesar, uh, the writing on the war on, um, in Gaul, where he's talking about the way that the military commander sees the landscape and thinks about the high ground, the forested ground, the boggy, marshy areas, and that this physicality of the landscape is important for the military and political kinds of questions. So those are the sorts of things that I'm beginning to get interested in around these issues. And it's the same if you look at uh, resources, so oil or other mineral resources. If you look at uh, resources above the surface of the earth, so timber, for example, um, or the, the way that mining is often done now with the, the clear cutting of just, uh, sorry, the clear strip mining, where you just strip the top off the mountain and then extract the various, rather than drilling in to reach the actual scene itself. So there's a physicality to these, as well as a kind of politics to it. And again, infrastructure projects, so pipelines, um, any other kind of connection between places. So the physical is very important to me. And I think it's just one last example on, on this of why I think this has been somewhat neglected by the Canals. Canals seem to me to be a really interesting question because of the wars that have been fought over canals. So the Suez Canal War uh, and the Panama War. And the reason they're important is not the canal itself, but it's the connection. It's the way of, of flow of physical transportation of goods from one place to another, made a lot easier by the Suez Canal. You no longer have to circumnavigate uh, Africa, or the Panama Canal, you no longer have to go around the foot of South America. 
to get between places, the physical transportation of material objects, and these kind of strategic choke points in canals, the Straits of Hormuz, the Straits of Malacca, um, the, the land or the, the sea off the coast of Somalia, and why piracy is such a problem, is because these are channels through which the transportation of major resources and goods. These, for me, are a very physical material sense, rather than the, the way that Heidegger wants to use this as resources for the philosophical project. I've got uh, three questions, yeah. Oh, and first, thanks. Thanks for, for the inspiring uh, outline of the new geopolitics. Um, uh, I'm a bit worried about bringing the material in, uh, especially if you link it to, to the canals that you just mentioned. How do we avoid that, that we jump back automatically with that in, in a kind of 19th century geopolitical thinking? It seems that politicians now, they have two modes of thinking. One is about mar markets and everything that goes with that. And then you're willing to cooperate. And the other is, as soon as you mention geography, they jump back to a kind of old-fashioned sovereignty discourse. And I'm a bit more concerned in that respect in how you define uh, power, geopower, as a kind of base, but power seems to be defined here in rather antagonistic terms rather than cooperative ones. So I wonder what what will the practical consequence be of your new introduction of materiality in geopolitics? Well, um, I wouldn't claim you know my view. Uh, course, I think there's but. many many people that are making these arguments, and I'm trying to build and develop some of those for, for thinking about these kinds of questions. Um, I mean, I'm aware of the reactionary potential, and that was why I spent a little bit of time talking about people like Carl Schmitt and Heidegger uh, and others, and that turned back uh, Robert Kaplan's recent book, The Revenge of Geography, um, is a sort of Halford Mackinder for the 21st century uh, kind of project, which is a very strange thing. He seems to have neglected the fact that there was a 20th century where work was written by geographers. Uh, and jump back to the 19th century to sort of rediscover this <coughs> policy makers. But then he sells more books than any academic on the kind of progressive side. So, you know, maybe he's got something right in that. Um, so I'm aware of that as a caution. And the simple answer is don't touch it. I'm trying to think, is there a way of addressing these kinds of questions? Because I think with something like climate change, the, the geophysical transformations that are happening have to be taken more seriously by political actors. And I don't think that you can neglect the fact that there are very real geophysical transformations that have political implications. I think if you look at the potential migration that's going to happen, if you look at some of the low-lying Pacific islands where the territory may entirely disappear with sea level rise, and that you may then have a population and a sovereign government but no territory, this changes the way that we need to think about politics. In, in these kind of conditions. So it seems to me there's a challenge there that can't just be ducked because people use this for progressive politics in the past. And I don't think I've got all the answers to this. I do think there's a, a great danger of a turn back to that rootedness in the soil and, and claims to land and indig indigenous politics and the, the res resurgence of a kind of an autochthony, um, the kind of anti-immigration politics that you see getting mobilized about we were here first and that these are outside. I, 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 I know all of that is there, but I don't think that we can simply duck the challenge because it seems to me that a lot of things that are going on are requiring a renewed importance around these kinds of questions. If you look at um, what's happening with the transformation of landscapes in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, in the African continent, not for the people and the governments that are in those places, but through the multinational corporations that have bought up large areas of land to make these. These seem to me to be, to require a need to address those kinds of questions. But I'm, I, I agree with you, there is a, a danger of the, the turn back to that reactionary way of thinking about it. And it's that balance that I'm trying to to work through, and that, that this talk is an attempt to sketch out at least the problem, if not necessarily the solution to these kind of questions. Does that help? This helps. One and then two. Better. <coughs> um, hello, my name is uh, Jessica de Boer. I'm a PhD. Can you speak up. Uh, oh, my name is Jessica de Boer. I'm a PhD student at the Spatial Planning, Poly Fontina. And um, I'm 
I'm working at the moment also a little bit with complexity theory and thinking about a complex adaptive system and being both robust and complex. And I think that your talk inspired me to think a bit more of this connecting the geopolitics to the geophysical. Um, and I'd like you to ask you to uh, perhaps to think a bit along if you can think of robustness perhaps as being connected also to legal constructions and is that perhaps now the case and if you could connect it more to the geophysical could you is there then another way of finding a robustness in the system have you thought about that? Um, gosh that, that's a great question I don't know um, do you mean robustness as in sort of durability um, Okay, I mean, I think there are people that have written around those kinds of questions um, about either systems that are adaptive um, or systems that are able to be um, maintained and, and updated and, reg and um, can be transformed in response to particular kinds of events, either through an interaction that's within the system as a closed or that are coming in from outside. So people have written about um, maintenance and repair within complex systems. Uh, people have written about the, well, I mean, there's some interesting work done about the um, ruins and uh, destruction of physical artifacts and then kind of the transformation of them and the repurposing of them. And one of the things that I think comes through in the Fed is the way the, the original plan for something, be it a city, be it a large-scale territorial project, be it can be transformed and reworked into something else at some future point. It's not completely determined by the original purpose. And so you find things where systems are set up for one purpose and then get transformed and used for some other purpose at some future point. Or you get things that are set up as a kind of like a frame or a container for what they think now, but with a possibility of a transformation you equally get systems that are building with, with built-in obsolescence, that they know that they're going to um, fail to be important within a certain time period and therefore have to be renewed and transformed. So I don't have a good answer to the question, but I think there's something in the way theorists of technology think about those kind of questions, that it can be in, in a different set of registers. And you either build a, a system that is um, as durable as possible, or you build in the possibility of its renewal or its transformation, or you build in a kind of an obsolescence and then a, 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 re, um, a refit of those kind of questions. So, I mean, it connects to the digital and the cities thing. So, uh, you may know of the Hudson Yards project in uh, New York City, uh, which is on the, the, um, the west bank of the Manhattan Island, uh, around Midtown. And they're building, this is the largest infrastructure and um, investment project in New York City in decades. It's this very, very large area over the, uh, and they're building on top of the Long Island Railroad um, sidings, where they put the trains at the end of the day and beginning of the day. And they're going to build enormous tower blocks in there. Now they're building into this a kind of a smart city type infrastructure so that this research center at New York University can use the data gathered in these to analyze, to understand better how cities work. The problem is, is they're building this now uh, with a long scale, close to a decade time scale. They don't really know what the technology is going to be in 10 years. They don't really know the systems that they're going to require. But they're trying to build it in such a way that they can reuse the, um, the basic infrastructure for a new system at some future point. And the model that they use with this is um, the Manhattan grid system was laid out long before all of those areas were occupied and long before anybody knew we'd be driving cars along them. But they laid it out with enough space for the grid system cleared of blocks that it could be repurposed and, and reused for future technologies as yet unknown. And I think that that's one of the ways that some of these are constructed is to try to think, not to try to predict what the future might be, but to try to build for an unpredictable future. And in a sense, that, I, I hope, gets to something of, along the lines that you're trying to think about. Does that help with that? Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah, We've got two more questions. Are you happy? Yeah? Sure. Herman. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, lecture that you gave. I was a bit confused with the, uh, with the phrase 
process. In the beginning of your talk, you were stressing the big questions in IR, uh, geopolitics, it's all about process, which in this most abstract sense. And then you came up with the, uh, uh, with a quote from uh, Gross, Elizabeth Grove, and then you thought that most, um, you, th you said, I disagree with many of what she's saying, but I like the process approach. And then I was a bit confused. Aren't you not rather um, depoliticizing uh, territory, territory rather than regrounding uh, uh, geopolitics? Because exactly the point that you're criticizing from geopolitics, that it has become the most abstract way, process. Now, the most, the most well-defined and well-given example that is involved is here's a strong point of growth, and that's exactly the point of the process. So that's what you stress as being very important. So I was wondering to what extent are you depoliticizing de territory rather than regrounding geopolitics? To what extent am I depoliticizing territory? Yeah. OK. Well, I don't think I am. Because I actually think that, that a lot of the ways people have conceived territory has been as a container within which politics occurs. I'm not saying depoliticize, I'm repoliticize. I'm trying to repoliticize it because I think that the, the the question of territory is itself a political question, not simply where politics happens. And I try to do that through what I call a, a more process way of thinking about it. And in that, I'm partly drawing on somebody like um, David Harvey, where he talks about the urban process. That the urban is not a static product, but the urban is something that is made and remade through the relations of capital, individual people, resistance, these kind of processes that are going on are shaping and reshaping that. And in a sense, what I'm trying to do with territory is to say, the, the, the territory should not be seen as an object, as an outcome of a process, but itself as a process. And that, that's certainly what I've tried to do with the question of territory. And I would hope that at least the territory work is consistent within the way that I'm thinking about those kinds of questions. I'm prepared to accept that as I try and build that into the more geo work and pick up on somebody like Elizabeth Gross, there's a risk of a, a blurring around those, those kinds of questions. But what I like about her uh, way of thinking about these questions is the recognition that territory is produced and transformed through contests, through uh, understandings, through actions, through the operations of these different types of um, mechanisms. And that seems to me to be close to the way that I was trying to think about those kinds of questions. I find the vitalism in her problematic but I don't find the what I'd call the process side problematic in that. So, so I would hope it's not entirely inconsistent, but I, I'm not sure I'm getting at your question. Because you criticised that in the beginning of your talk, it's a process. And now but why, did, when did I criticise what? When, when did I criticise process as the way to understand it? That, well, that's it's, the, it's 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 my understanding of how you come up with the uh, the. the current idea about geopolitics, it's, it's about the process that matters, but it may be a misunderstood that. I, I may well have misspoke, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say that you didn't hear what I was saying. I, my problem with the way that geopolitics gets talked about is that the, the geo element gets dropped in so much work, and it just gets understood as big international relations. So, so you can, t if somebody talks about, say, the geopolitics of climate change, you quite often find people talking about great power politics and their interests and how those interests to relate to whether they might want to put a cap on emissions to make a trade as a possibility about how they work. And it's politics in a straightforward way, but just between big states to think about a particular political process called climate change. What I think somebody like Simon Dolby is doing, and I'd want to follow along that, that kind of way of doing it, is saying, you cannot think about the geopolitics of climate change without thinking about the geopolitics of Earth processes. And that, that seems to me, so, so the example for it, of, of sea level rise having political implications in low-lying countries, some of which, Netherlands is a good example, have good flood defences, others which is, which is Bangladesh have much worse flood defences, or the Pacific Islands, or 
simple answer of, of climate change and sea level rise, this has geopolitical implications and we need to think about the dynamics of the Earth processes in order to address those kind of questions. That, that, that was really the critique of the standard work. Okay, and the last question is mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I'd escape. I, I very much like uh, your, your idea of thinking territory in terms of volume. And I think there's a lot of uh, promise in that. I was thinking about Schrodinger. We, we sit here, we stand uh, on top of huge gas deposits. And this is where the gas in the Netherlands is. And it has been for a while, and there has been lots of exploitation of gas. Uh, and uh, it worked. Uh, for a while, and suddenly uh, earthquakes started to happen. And uh, big complaints about it, uh, big opposition. So now there's an agreement that they will reduce the exploitation of gas because that, that's having consequences. But that's not the same story around the world. Take Colombia, for example, where in some parts of the eastern uh, flatlands of the country, they're extracting lots of uh, gas and oil. Lots of things are happening, and the government says, we need the money, we're going to carry on doing it we might relocate you with all the implications that has, uh, that has and so on. I'm thinking here geopolitics and biopolitics together uh, around the idea of volume. Yeah. But I think there's an element that, perhaps a connecting element that would help us think biopolitics and geopolitics uh, as you are suggesting, but I didn't hear it in your talk. You might have thought about it and maybe you can reflect about it, okay. which is value. And it's the idea of value as perhaps a quasi-transcendental here, which does not have a universal meaning. Uh, it relates to the geopolitical and the biopolitical in its radical relationality, if you wish. And uh, it becomes not a correlate of the two ideas, but actually are an enabler of them. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something about that. The value question is an interesting one, and I, other people may disagree with this, and I do tend to annoy um, semi Marxists with some of the work I've done on territory. Because for me, the economic is, is crucial to understanding territory, but it's nowhere close to sufficient to understand the territory. And I'd probably say the same kind of thing with biopolitics and geopolitics. What I think a lot of people on, on territory do, Marxist accounts, they really quickly collapse territory into land, and then they very quickly collapse land into rent. And they turn territory issues into scaled up property over land issues, and then what value that land has and what you can extract from it. The question of value, I suppose. Mm. And I don't want to say that's unimportant. It seems to me that's absolutely crucially important, but it doesn't seem to me to capture the complexity of territory which has strategic, legal, technical, and I suppose geophysical aspects to it as well. So I say much less about the economic and the kind of value of the property and land than I think a lot of people expected, simply because I think there's loads of work doing that already, so I'm gonna try and do something that's additional to that and, and goes on. And I think, in a sense, that's what I'm doing here. Because if you look at, say, resource geopolitics, or resource, geographies more generally. Um, the political economy angle in that is so strong and has been the dominant way that, that that work is thought that I think other people now are starting to say, sure, we can do a political economy of natural gas or of oil or of timber or of minerals or whatever, but also we need to take into account mm. other things that are perhaps neglected in straightforward political economy accounts. Mm. And so that would be the, the the suggestion I'd make is, I, I don't want to ask that, hmm. and I think that what is maybe being somewhat neglected in those accounts is perhaps what this approach can add in hmm. as, a, as a supplement rather than as a replacement. I was thinking more about the moral economy here rather than okay. the political economy, and uh, understanding value not only in economic terms, and I agree that's, that's something there, but as a moral element, uh, philosophically if you wish. So for instance, uh, the value that uh, a three-dimensional understanding of territory could have in specific given well, specific circumstances. And I think that uh, if we are to think of value economically, we're stuck with that discourse mm -hmm. always. And, and then well, we can quantify it. And we can, if we are to think beyond number here, in, in terms of the, of, mm -hmm. the, of the moral aspect of value, 
we might find a space from which to think of these two elements without having to define them, without having to say this is biopolitical, this is geopolitical, which I think is part of the problem as well. We're creating another yeah. binary. No, I don't, I don't want to say that there's a binary between them. Um, but it, you know, I, I think that one of the problems is you've got books, and this is by Julian Reed, who you'll know, The Biopolitics of the War on Terror, um, or Macmillan's forthcoming book, The Biopolitics of Security, as if sometimes the suggestion, I'm not really saying it about either Reed or Dylan, but some people saying, you know, geopolitics, we're kind of done with that, now it's biopolitics. In the same way that Foucault suggests the object of government has shifted from territory in the past to population as the emergent. I think both of those are problematic for, for related reasons. And so for me, it's the co-production and the continual kind of intermingling of those. Rather than the two are separate, and we need to look at both, but it's the continual intermingling of those. So if you look at a, a census, for example, uh, population census and distribution, population density, these are biopolitics and geopolitics together because it's the distribution of bodies on or within particular spaces. Those two are always intertwined. You can't separate out the two distinctly. Value, in that moral sense, um, I'm hesitant to give it too much sort of a separate kind of status within that relation. Um, I would immediately kind of think, well, it's always intertwined and tangled up between and within and takes on uh, its political power through those kinds of structures. But I, I need to think about that more. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much for having